Okay, so another Mrs. H psychology. This time it's about gambling addiction for AQA um, specification and it's year two addiction topic. This time at gambling addiction and here we're going to explain it using learning theory. So I'm just going to um, zoom right um, down so that you can see roughly right out so you can see roughly the pattern okay and then I'm going to minimize certain bits so we're going to have a branch for SLT a branch for uh, classical conditioning CC OC is operant conditioning and then the evaluation so four different branches you can see so I'm going to um, zoom in so you can see each of these we'll start with SLT Okay, so with social learning theory, obviously we start with our key terms. We want to say that with SLT, we observe role models and we imitate them. Part of that is vicarious reinforcement. So we are indirectly learning. Um, unlike the behaviorists, we, uh, with SLT, we learn indirectly. We are able to learn indirectly through the experiences of others. So vicariously, vicariously reinforced, being reinforced by seeing somebody else um, gain something for example. There are also mediating factors like being motivated in some way to um, to copy them. Um, with SLT in terms of applying it to gambling obviously we've got media encouragement um, at the moment there's lots and lots of adverts on TV all the time bombarding people with the ideas about gambling and how they can gain um, financial rewards for example. So we might see others being rewarded in terms of their fun, um, playing poker, winning money for example and therefore that can be applied to gambling. We'll come back to the research in a moment. So let's go on to operant conditioning over here and we'll start off with our key terms with operant conditioning. So operant conditioning obviously involves reinforcement and we've got positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is gaining something. So basically with both types of reinforcement, we're always strengthening a behavior. With positive, we gain something pleasant. With negative, we're taking away something unpleasant. So examples in terms of gambling, um, with positive reinforcement, we would, for example, get the win. So with financially gaining, we might get the buzz and the excitement of being part of a game and, and having the opportunity to win. With negative, it may be that we are being reinforced by um, the withdrawal of our anxiety when we're gambling. We're hoping that we're going to win and therefore take away all our financial problems, something like that. Okay, so we've got those aspects of reinforcement. We also need to bring in partial reinforcement. So partial reinforcement, when behavior is reinforced, when your behavior is reinforced in, in only some of the time, for example, um, it could be variable interval or it could be variable ratio, and we'll talk about those. So partial behavior is reinforced any part of the time it occurs. Now specifically, we need to talk about variable ratio. And variable ratio is a type of partial behavior in which behavior is um, reinforced but after an unpredictable number of responses. Okay, so this is actually very important in terms of reinforcing us and in terms of us learning. So it's the most persistent type of um, learning. Okay, so let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. So as we said, variable ratios, behavior reinforced after unpredictable number of responses. Okay, it produces the most persistent learning. So for example, let's say, and this is going to be important that you say on average or every 25 spins, let's say on average or every, I don't know, five or 10 or whatever times of um, doing the lottery or scratch cards or whatever. Remember that's 10, you would say every 10 on average, then we get um, a random number of responses in that. So for example, after, if, if we're going every 25 spins on average, so after every 11 for the first time, and then the next time it's after 38, um, there is a, a win or something like that. So th we, we never, it's an unpredictable pattern, so we don't know what's coming up. We don't know when we're going to win. And that's why it's the most persistent sort of learning, because 
you are going to continue it because you don't know whether your turn is next to win. So it does take longer to learn, but it is also longer to extinguish because you're just always hoping that yours is going to be the next one that wins. Um, so they learn that they won't win any each time, um, but they're not sure when, so they keep going. Okay, so variable ratio is important in terms of gambling. If we have a look at um, the research on this, so we have, for example, Noah et al., uh, Blasinski and Noah et al. So they looked at secondary data um, on, um, so basically they were analyzing gambling literature. And what they decided was that there were three categories of gamblers, right? Those who were behaviorally conditioned, those who were emotionally vulnerable and those who were antisocial impulsive gamblers. And they record, they concluded as a result um, that they concluded that these, these behavioral conditioned uh, gamblers, group A, um, that was the result of being conditioned. So not only with winning money, not only with the thrill of it, but also they um, experienced reinforcement with things like a near miss. So even if they got one, for example, the lottery, they got one answer, that is enough to reinforce them to keep going. The thing is, um, these behaviourally condition, this, this explanation, doesn't account for other groups, so the emotionally vulnerable, the antisocial, impulsive. Okay, It's only explaining one group of gamblers, those who are behaviourally um, conditioned. So let's go now to classical conditioning. We know with classical conditioning, we have um, learning by association. We are talking about reflexive behaviours with classical conditioning. And really what you should have is your little diagram, UCS to UCR, UCS plus neutral stimulus to UCR, and conditioned stimulus to conditioned response. UCS, unconditioned stimulus to unconditioned response. And classical conditioning, really important in terms of ap application to gambling, particularly this area, which is an important part of the specification, cue reactivity, right? How we respond to other cues. So basically what we would say is, um, I just outlined one thing first of all, that, that if we gamble, that leads to excitement and arousal, okay? So our gambling... Um, would, you know, that's the unconditioned stimulus, which leads to unconditioned response of, of arousal. Um, and here we're saying that when we gamble, there are other cues around, and those are um, associated with the gambling to get the desired response of arousal. And so in the end, all we need are those other cues, that, uh, which would be the conditioned stimulus, which would lead to our conditioned response of arousal and excitement. So if we have a look at this in a little bit more detail, we're talking about these cues being secondary reinforcers. They are paired up, they're made to be an association, they're, they're associated with the primary reinforcer of the gambling um, event, really. Okay, so other cues that we could talk about are things like, you know, the colours of the scratch cards, the literally just going to internet betting sites walking past a betting shop, things like that. So we associate those with the primary um, stimulus, so the unconditioned stimulus, that, you know, and, and we're pairing those up. We're learning an association between the actual gambling behavior and these secondary events, these secondary reinforcers, these stimuli, these cues. So we learn to be excited and aroused by these secondary um, it reinforces these secondary events really. Um, these act as cues for arousal even before you start betting and the problem is that these cues are always around you know we we can't avoid them usually so it makes it very difficult for people to abstain and to give up um, and therefore that is why relapse is very high for people who are trying to avoid um, gambling shops or, or gambling stimuli. So you'll see that I put research in different places. 
I'm actually going to refer, we've got some research here, but I'm going to refer to that with these um, different evaluator points. So we've got reductionism, lack of explanatory power, individual differences, and limited explanation as a starting point for our evaluation. So let's have a look at these. So I've just removed some from the screen, right? So reductionism, basically, um, it, it's you know it is a very limited and and we would say uh, a low level explanation. Okay, so it doesn't explain other factors. For example, what about the big winner who doesn't become addicted? You know, they win once, they win big, but they don't continue to gamble and they don't um, find it problematic. You know, ditto. What about the little winner who might become addicted? They just win the odd scratch card or something, but they become addicted. Um, and therefore, you know, we, we're only really, um, it, it can help to understand and explain certain behaviours, but not, not all types of gamblers. The other thing it can't explain is that it doesn't really satisfactorily explain initiating gambling in the first place. You know why? Why there must be some other factor involved for people to start gambling in the first place before they even get reinforced. So let's get rid of that one. So second evaluator point: it lacks explanatory power, meaning that it's quite it's got quite a limited explanation. For example, we've got the law of so behaviorism. Um, exp talks about the law of contiguity, look at the spelling of that, contiguity, and that states that the two stimuli have to be, have to occur together very closely in time for that association to be made, but that therefore doesn't really explain all sorts of learning. Um, for example, let's say something like poker has delayed responses between the bet and the outcome, so how can this, you know, learning by association, and this reinforcement, it doesn't really explain that fully. So next one, um, let's minimize that. Next one, individual differences. We know that cognitive factors have to be, have to play a role, they have to be, they are important. So for example, People's motivations to start, to continue are all different. And so, so those, um, the motivation to actually gamble and initiate it, continue with it, etc., is all going to be different. Um, so other, some people are able to stop fairly easily, whereas others will relapse. And so we mustn't forget these individual differences, these cognitive factors. It seems likely that there are cognitive factors at play here as well. So when we do the cognitive model, you'll see, but it seems likely that there are um, what we would call distortions of thinking that are involved with gambling. So we can't just say it's a learning thing. There have to, has to be, you know, S-O-R, cognitive factors, the you, you, the organism, and the mediating factors that become between the stimulus and response that plays a key role, particularly with gambling. Um, and finally, we would say that we've got limited explanation um, th this idea of reinforcement and learning, it is important, but it differs at different stages. So it might explain persistence and also escalation, increasing your gambling habit, right? So persisting with it and, and in fact, developing it even further. But perhaps it's not such a good um, explanation for the initial start of it. SLT might be quite useful in terms of seeing and, and seeing role models um, and therefore copying them. But in terms of other behaviorists, um, classical and operant, it might not be such a good, it's a limited explanation in terms of initiation, for example. So why is this all important? Why are we talking about um, learning theory and gambling? Well, it's estimated that a lot of people will have as much debt as about £60,000. And remember that um, gambling is the only behavioural addiction that we have on the DSM-5 at the moment. OK, that, that may change, but at the moment it's the only behavioural addiction, so it is important. Um, also, remember, the explanations tend to be psychological. They are psychological because... 
um, we are not aware of, you know, it's, it's not a drug, it's a behavior that's causing this addiction, basically. It's not a drug that's causing biological changes, and that's why it is, um, the, the explanations for it tend to focus around psychological explanations.